isn't God good? Don't you just love him? Yeah, I'm yeah. so thankful I'm a Christian. I wouldn't want to have chosen any other life, would you? That's and to it. think that God chose us. Yeah. We didn't have enough sense to even know that we needed him. <laughs> but he came along and he chose us. Yeah. We're so, so blessed. It's such a good thing to know the Lord and to be able to be his children. This morning, we're going to be looking at the sign of silence. Um, this is a little play on words, but uh, we're going to be looking at a, our scripture emphasis is found in Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. And I don't want to read the entire thing, but I'm going to read some of it to you. Uh, I guess we're too loud for somebody else. <laughs> oh, I see. <clears throat> All right. Here we go. I like uh, the NIV version of the Bible. Does anyone have a preference? A version that you like? The message. It's a good Bible. It, it's not a good study Bible, but it is a good Bible. <clears throat> it's easy for people to understand. What about you, B? What do you like? I have no idea. <laughs> well, most of the scriptures are on your handout. So uh, you can follow along with me, but <clears throat> forgive me, I've got a, something going on here. Yes! We're on <clears throat> Luke chapter 1, verses 5 through 25. And I think this is really a really cool story in the scripture. Um, there are a couple of things. Well, there's a whole bunch of things I could spend time on, but uh, we're not going <clears> to <throat> do that because it would take us all day. So I'm just going to emphasize a couple of things. But before we start, does anyone have a prayer need this morning? It's good to see you back, Jill. <laughs> Anybody have a prayer need? How's things going with you, Cynthia? <clears throat> well, I've had a hard week, too. I've had uh, extremely low blood pressure, extremely low, 80 over 50, uh, just, you know, to the point where you stand up and it's like you can't stand up. So <clears throat> I have made an executive decision and I quit the medication that I think is making me have it. And um, I think I'll call my doctor on Monday. but. Keep me in your prayers because I am I am concerned. I don't. It makes it hard to function when your blood pressure is that low. You need to have a normal, <laughs> at least at least a hundred, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so right, Barbara. And so anyway, uh, I'd appreciate your prayers. Uh, anyone else have a prayer request this morning? Yes, Martha. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's sad. A friend of a uh, friend or relative? A niece. A niece that had been battling cancer for several years and things were looking good and then all of a sudden she had a turn and she was gone in two days. And you know, we don't understand these things, but we live in a world that has a curse on it. Death is part of that curse. And one day it's gonna be removed. Jesus removed it at Calvary. But you and I are still subject to it because we're still living in a corrupted body, right? Yeah. Until we get that incorruptible body, then we're still subject to it. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Does anyone want to volunteer to pray this morning for us? Anybody? Okay, Martha, thank you.
Thank you, Martha. <coughs> All right, so our scripture emphasis, as I've already said, is going to be from Luke uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 25, and for some reason it went away from that when I, uh, <laughs> when I closed it up. But I do believe that it's in our handout. And we can read some of this together. There were in, uh, was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of uh, the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. So notice that they were both quite elderly at this point. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to turn incense, I mean to burn incense, when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. Now incense was offered as a form of worship, of praise. <clears throat> Whenever incense was being burned, it was a way that they were praising God. So outside of this holy place, all these people were praising God as he was, as he was waving that uh, little uh, instrument and allowing that incense to just flow through. And the praises of God just wafted through that entire place. So it was an exciting thing for uh, the people there. <clears throat> anyway, so we go on and um, we read that, and there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, or Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answering him said unto him, I am Gabriel. Notice how he said this. I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God and am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And I believe, now my, the emphasis is my own, but I really believe that Gabriel emphasized these very things that I'm emphasizing. He said, and behold, thou shalt be dumb. In other words, you're not going to be able to talk anymore. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. Yeah. So this is our primary scripture. We'll be looking at a lot of other scriptures in this particular study. 
Then we're also going to look at Mark 8, 10 through 12. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. So people always want a sign. Now let's talk a little bit about the priesthood and what was going on. Zacharias was of the lineage of priests. And if you've read in the Old Testament, you know that God set up a, a sort of uh, rotation that the priests would go through. And so they may not enter the Holy of Holies, but one time in a year, they may not. And so Zacharias, here he was, it's time for him to go through his rotation and he enters into the Holy of Holies. Now, this, this was the year that Jesus was to be born and was the year for Zacharias, a rotation. He was waving the incense in the Holy of Holies when the angel named Gabriel appeared before him. Now, in the scripture, there are four angels who are named. They are Gabriel and Michael. Those are God's angels. Yep. Gabriel and Michael. I want you to notice in the terms that Gabriel used. He said, I stand in the presence of God. Yeah. Wow. I stand in the presence of God. In other words, God sent me here personally to tell you this because I stand in God's presence. So uh, there are two other angels, Abaddon and, uh, goodness, all of a sudden I... I lost the name of the other one. Lucifer. <laughs> I don't know why I could forget him. But both of those are fallen angels. Yeah. Those were two angels that went with uh, Lucifer when he was forced from heaven, kicked out from heaven because he was full of pride and wanted to take over God's role. So those are the only angels that are mentioned in Scripture. And if anybody gives you the name of some other angel, they're in error, okay? Because there are only four that are mentioned in the Bible. Uh, now, this story has several things that we could emphasize when we look at it. But there were two things that come to my mind, and they are most prevalent. And I think one of them is demanding a sign, wanting God to show me something. You ever said, God, if you're you're up there and you're working on my behalf, show me. Give me a sign. Give me a sign. Let me see some wonder or some miracle so that I'll believe. And Jesus, in the scripture that we read in Mark, was rather annoyed with them constantly demanding a sign. They had to see something happen before they believed. And there are people like that today. I've had people say to me, well, you know, if God would just appear to me and he would talk to me. Really? This is a faith walk. <laughs> the Bible says the just shall live by faith. We're not going to be able to see God until we go to the other side. If we did see him, we wouldn't survive. We couldn't because he is awesome. His presence is astounding. Even Moses could only see the back part of God. He never saw God's face. So we see these people demanding the sign. And then also we see doubt coming up. And I want you to think, have you ever doubted God? Have you ever doubted something that you were heard or were taught? And you thought, well, maybe that's not true. Or anybody in here? We all have, haven't we? We've all encountered doubt. The thing is, is when we have these things come up, we need to make sure that we recognize what the source of the doubt is. And we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Demanding signs was something that uh, happened all through the scripture. And in the Old Testament, God used a lot of signs. The reason he did was because Jesus had not yet come. The Holy Spirit had not yet come. God's given us the Holy Spirit 
to lead and guide and direct our lives. But these people didn't have uh, this in the Old Testament. Now, a sign could actually be what a CSI person would call proof. They need evidence. <laughs> you know, we hear that all the time. We've got to have evidence. In the Old Testament, what did God do? He led the children of Israel with a cloud by day and a fiery cloud by night, right? God constantly allowed them to experience his presence. They were truly blessed in that sense. But not as blessed as we are because not only do we get to experience God's presence, but God lives in us. Uh -huh. He's set up his temple inside of us. So that makes it a far greater thing. The children of Israel just kind of wandered around and did whatever they were told to do. But God dwells within you and I as believers. Now, the children of Israel could not actually see God. But God did things that would convince them of his ever-abiding presence. He wanted them to believe and understand. And so they did need to see things. There's hundreds of signs in the Old Testament. If I spent, I could spend months and months, right, Martha? There's so many of them. So many things that God has done. Uh, I'll, uh, there's another little story here, the story of Gideon. In the Old Testament, uh, God asked Gideon to go to war against the Midianites. And Gideon was kind of a cowardly sort. And he said, well, I don't, you know, he said, I need you to, I'm going to put this fleece on the ground and I want you to keep it dry and let all the ground be wet. So the next morning Gideon gets up, he goes and he checks the fleece, the fleece is dry, the ground is wet. God did what he asked. Then he does it again. This time he says, I want all the ground to be dry and I want the fleece to be wet. And again, God did this. He demanded a sign because Gideon didn't have the Holy Spirit inside of him where he could actually believe God on the level that you and I can believe God. We live in the time of grace. Yeah. God's grace has been poured out. <laughs> Jesus has come. He's died on the cross. He's going to return. We're living in a wonderful time to serve and know God. And so we always see this, uh, these people that want to see a sign but you and I as believers today are quite, quite blessed because we're living in a time when God actually lives in us and works through us. Now, the scripture tells us that the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Hebrews tells us that faith is the substance of things not seen. Right. We don't see it. We can't see it. Now faith is. So we need to understand that God isn't always going to give us a sign. But in this particular case, Zacharias did not expect to get a sign of silence. He didn't expect that. This was actually more of a punishment for him. He comes out of that, that room, you know, the Holy of Holies. He comes out and he can't talk anymore. He can't talk anymore. Gabriel told him exactly what was to happen, but Zacharias could not believe what he heard. Now, isn't it interesting that Zacharias was a priest? He was a priest. He was in the temple, working for God, trying to serve God. And yet, he could not believe. You know, sometimes religion gets in your way. It, I know I've said this to y'all before. It can get in your way. It can hinder you having a real experience with God, can it, Deborah? It can get in your way. So, uh, Gabriel told him, he said, this is what's going to happen. And Zacharias immediately begins to make excuses for the reasons why this could not happen. He said that he and Elizabeth were just too old. Uh -huh. Actually, he and Elizabeth 
were a type of Abraham and Sarah. They were a type of Abraham and Sarah. God took the most unlikely couple and he said, these people are going to have the prophet John. And John is going to share the gospel. He's going to, he's going to lead my people back to a place of repentance. Now, Gabriel was quite blunt in his reply to Zacharias. He wasn't going to put up with his uh, attempt to uh, undermine what God had said. Now, initially, when Gabriel came up in Luke, 11, uh, Luke 1, 11, and 12, Zacharias became fearful. Anybody ever seen an angel in here? I have. It's a frightening thing. It's a frightening thing to see an angel of God. That's a frightening thing. And so it wasn't something that we can really chide Zacharias about. But here he was, a follower of God, a priest. He worked in the temple. And you would have thought that he would have had a different kind of heart than he had, right? Yeah. But instead, he was frightened by what he saw. So when he saw him appear there, uh, Zacharias was troubled and fear gripped him. Now, what is a hindrance to faith? Done. What's a hindrance? Fear. Yes. Fear robs you with the ability, of the ability to believe God. Fear takes away uh, your ability to believe does. God. And that's exactly what happened here with Zacharias. He became afraid. Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous people. They loved God and they served him faithfully. We couldn't look at their lives and find fault with them. The scripture even says, they were blameless and walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord but it just wasn't enough because they just couldn't believe at least Zacharias couldn't believe he couldn't believe so anyway he became fearful and Gabriel told him he said don't be afraid and he began to talk to him he said in verse 13 uh, fear not Zacharias for thy prayer is heard and Zacharias probably thought I wonder which prayer that is <laughs> because they're old people. Do you think he's still praying for a child and he's an old man? Yeah, I doubt yeah. it. I doubt point. it. <laughs> but at some point, at some point in his life, he and Elizabeth had prayed for a child. And he says, Thy prayers heard. And then he goes on, he says, uh, Elizabeth is going to bear a son and you're going to call his name John. And he says, Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. And then he goes on to describe the life that John is going to live. He's not going to drink wine or strong drink. He's going to be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. So this is how John knew that he was to go out and preach the Messiah, because he was full of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost directed John in what he was to do. He says, many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he went on to say, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, which is Elijah. Notice that he doesn't get the double portion that Elisha had, but he has the spirit and power of Elijah. He's going to be able to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, and to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this was good news. It was glad tidings. Uh -huh. And Gabriel gives him this good news about John, his son. Yeah. But Zacharias is afraid, and he has doubts. Yeah. He doubts. Doubt is being uncertain of mind. Doubt is being uncertain of mind. John or James 1, 6 through 8 says, 
but let him ask in faith nothing wavering for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord a double minded man in other words somebody that jumps from well maybe God will do it maybe he won't maybe he'll do it maybe he won't I don't know if he can do it well maybe he can do it you know that kind of attitude a double minded man is unstable in all his ways right Charles he's unstable he doesn't know what God can do so James describes the doubtful mind as being unstable now Gabriel's response to uh, to Zacharias was, I am Gabriel. You know, I stand in the presence uh-huh. of God and I've been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And he says, now you're not going to talk anymore. <laughs> you will be silent. That's true. Now, why do you think God chose to silence Zacharias? Why did he use that as his sign? What can we do to people's faith if we're doubters? We can undermine it. We can go around and say, well, you know, God does heal, but everybody that I know that had that kind of cancer, they didn't live. Do you see what I'm saying? We can go around and kind of in a way insinuate and cause that person to begin to doubt what God has showed them my friend if God shows you something if God has told you that this is the way it's going to be you need to believe it you need to hang on to it because he's going to take care of it he will do what he promises that he'll do he will take care of us So this sign of the validity of Gabriel's words was that Zacharias would no longer be able to speak. God did not want Zacharias to go home and begin to tell Elizabeth this in a negative connotation and in some way hinder her ability to believe. God didn't want that. So he wouldn't let him talk. He couldn't talk anymore. He would have to be silent. Are doubts wrong? Is it wrong to be to have a doubt? Not really. It's human. Yeah, it's a human nature. It's, it's, it's not it's wrong. Right. It's not wrong, but it's what it's rooted in that we need to look at. What are our doubts rooted in? Now, if it's just something that we're questioning, we're not sure about, you know, we're just kind of uncertain about it, uh, then I don't think that it's necessarily wrong. It's very easy for us to have doubts about something. You know, but we have got to stand when it all, when the rubber meets the road, this is the book that yeah, we've got to stand that's on. It. Very true. We just have to go back to that book and say, this is what you said, Lord. This is what you said. Maybe it doesn't make sense to other people, but this is what you said, and I'm going to believe it because you said it. Now, sin can cause us to doubt. Sin in our lives. The scripture tells us that sin separates us from God. So as Christians, what do we have to do about sin? We've got to take care of it right away, don't we? And we have someone. We have an advocate through Christ. The Bible says that we have this advocate. We can go to him and he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. So there's nothing that could happen in your life that God can't forgive you for. There's nothing that God can't forgive you for if you're willing to go to him and confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Another source of doubt is Satan. What did what did uh, Genesis 3 and 4 say? You will not certainly die. 
the serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. No. He's putting it out there. Yeah, no. You can't really believe what God said, you know, you know, that's really not true. You're really not going to die. But did Adam and Eve die when they sinned in the garden? Did they? No. They experienced spiritual death. And that spiritual death was passed on to every one of us until we're made alive in Christ. <laughs> True. Praise God, we are made alive in Christ. That's how they died, spiritual death. Another thing that, that the enemy will use is unbelief. If you simply don't believe what God's word says. And well, I do believe. Yes, we need to. But if you don't believe, then this can cause great doubt in your life. And it can cause a, a big hindrance to what God wants to do in your life. Misplaced faith in the world's wisdom. This is a very long, uh, and I don't know if I put it in your handout or not. 1 Corinthians 17 through 25. Did I put it in there, anybody? I try to put all the scriptures. Page four middle. Ah, okay. So we can we can have misplaced faith. Uh, the scripture tells us that we can put our confidence in the world's wisdom, and in so doing, we can it can cause us problems. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after uh, wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. So many of us sometimes put our confidence in the world's wisdom. And the world can be wise in many, in many ways. But our wisdom must be in God's book and in his, in his word. Another thing that can bring about doubts is spiritual instability. I've already read this to you from James, uh, where he said, But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. So this verse describes a person who's spiritually unstable. They just really can't believe that God can do this or that in their lives. They're unstable. And this is not what we're to be. We're to be firm in our Christian walk. Now, the, the response that was uh, gotten from uh, Zacharias was completely uh, different than the one that uh, I believe Elizabeth. Just a minute. I'm having. Um, use this. I'm gonna have to get my glasses. Notice that Elizabeth. She does not have the same attitude that Zacharias has. She has a different attitude.
everything. Sometimes I have to dig and dig. <laughs> Today, I only had to look just a little bit, not found it. All right, so now this is, uh, the scriptures here I'm giving you 26 through, uh, through 35 are where uh, Gabriel goes and he sent again and this time he sent from God to the city in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary and he goes up to her and says hail favored one think about this the Lord is with you and coming in he said to her uh, or, and she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary. So oh, notice she had that same initial response yeah. of being afraid. But he goes on to say, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary asks the logical question here. She says, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel answered, Gabriel answered, he said to her, the Holy Spirit yeah. will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. She who was called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary says these words. Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. You talk about faith. Yeah. Behold the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. Mary didn't say, hey, I don't want this embarrassment. Hey, don't do this to me. Don't let this happen. She listened to what Gabriel said and she was thrilled. She said, I am willing to serve God in whatever capacity he wants me to serve. So she had a very different response than Zacharias. Then Mary went and she visited Elizabeth. And at that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zacharias' home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, <clears throat> Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. I would say to you today, blessed are we who believe that the Lord fulfills his promises to us. God has a plan, and these two stories are really important because, not only because of the virgin birth and because of John's birth and Jesus' birth, but what they present is God's plan. God has a plan. And that plan was going to be fulfilled. He was not going to let anything hinder it. He wasn't going to let Zacharias' fears and doubts hinder it. He was not going to allow Zacharias to contradict what God had said. He was going to not allow that. God's timing had come. It's so important for us to understand this. There comes a time when God has a plan in our lives. And that plan is going to be accomplished. And nothing can hinder it. This is something that we really need to understand. Nothing 
can hinder what God wants to do. It was time for the Messiah to be born. It was time for Jesus to be born. It was on God's schedule. This is when it was going to be, and he was going to carry it out. It was necessary that John be born because John was going to be the prophet who would announce the Messiah's yeah. coming. Yeah. What I want you to understand is that God has a plan for your life and for my life. And my friend, if you and I stay in touch with God, there is nothing that can hinder God's plan. Nothing that can hinder it. It will be carried out, even if he has to make someone be silent. It will be accomplished. Nothing can hinder or will hinder God's eternal plan. Our doubts, fears, lack of belief cannot stop God from fulfilling his plan for eternity. God has a plan for us for eternity. The scripture tells us that Jesus Christ is going to come back. How many of you believe that? Oh, I yes. do. Yeah. I've yeah. looked for him since I was just a little kid and could understand what that meant. I have watched for him every day. There is a timing that God has, a perfect timing. We can look at all the signs, everything that's going on in the world, oh, and God. we can begin to see that all the things that prior to this time uh, could not be fulfilled can now be fulfilled. The two witnesses that we, we know about, Elijah and um, Moses, these two witnesses, they are going to be there and, and the whole world will be able to see them. The whole world can see them now. If you live in Bangladesh or you live in Saudi Arabia, no matter where you live, this is a small world. Yeah. You realize how Very small it is? Yeah. It's a small, small world that we live in. And we are connected one to another. What happens in China or Japan or the Philippines, or we see it instantly. I have a, a feature on my iPad that sends little signals all the time. If, some, if something's done in Congress, which rarely happens, but <laughs> if something's done in Congress, it'll blink across there and tell me. If there's been a shooting, if there's been an attack or whatever, it's right there. That couldn't have happened 25 years ago. That couldn't have happened. We are living in a day and hour when somebody can put something no bigger than a piece of rice under your skin and have all of your life information on it. Everything about you can be put there. All of your life, your medical history, where you've lived, your jobs, how much you made, if you paid your taxes, everything can be on there. So we are living in the last days. We are living in that time when these things are possible. When I was a girl, this wasn't possible. This couldn't have happened. We didn't have, I've got a little tiny uh, S drive, a, a little tiny SD card. And this thing is no bigger than this. 64 gig, little tiny thing. Another one that's about that big. 32, uh, or not, no, 250 gig. So we've got this opportunities that we never had before. We need to wake up and realize that God has an eternal plan. I don't know when God's going to come back, but I'll tell you, we need to live as if he is yeah. today because there's nothing left to be fulfilled except for his return. Nothing hinders God's plan. When God planned for the Messiah to be born, it was going to happen. When he planned for John to be born, it was going to happen. Nothing was going to stop it. God has a plan for our lives individually, but he also has a plan for all people collectively. We're not in this basket all by ourselves. 
Not really. No, we are a part of a huge group, and he's going to complete his plan in his own time and in his own way. I think this is a beautiful uh, scripture here. I'm going to read it to you, Acts 17, 26 through 31. It says, from one man, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. He marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their land. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Notice this, though he is not far from any one of us. He's not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He has given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. The man that he has appointed is Jesus Christ. He will be the judge. God is not far off, and we are his offspring. We need to be careful that we don't walk in ignorance, and we don't walk in doubt. And we don't always say, Lord, I need a sign, I need a sign. God doesn't want us to do that. He wants us to realize that he has a set time. And we are to occupy. What does that mean? Does it mean just sit, sit on the pew and do nothing? What does it mean, Barbara? Get busy. Our primary purpose is to share the gospel with the world with the world that is our purpose that's what we're called for to let the world know that God loves them he cares about them he loves you and I and cares about us so God has a plan for your life and my friend today may be the hour or the day that he comes back I don't know but I do know one thing he is coming back. And he has a schedule. I'm not privy to it. Not but really. I'm looking, I'm looking at everything that's going on and I'm aware that he's got a schedule and I need to follow it. Yeah. All right, let's stand. All right. Uh, you can <coughs> stay seated, I guess, if you want to. And let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we love you so very much. We're so thankful for your word, for your presence, for your blessings. What a gracious and wonderful Lord you are. What a privilege it is to be called your children. We thank you, Lord, that you called us to be your sons and daughters. And you've asked us that we would share you with this world that we live in. Help us to not be filled with doubts and unbelief, but to stay in your word and study your word and search your word for the truths that you would share with us. Help us to walk wisely with those who are without. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be. Watch over us now as we make our way into the next service. Bless and anoint by your sweet Holy Spirit. May a spirit of worship settle upon us that we would lift up your name. In Christ's name we pray. Everybody says? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank Amen. you so much for your faithfulness.